Blog Talk Radio. Stevie B's Media Production is a part of the Shellcaster Network. The proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ by members of the Churches of Christ. With your host, Stevie R. Butler. You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. Good evening. Thank you for tuning in to the Gospel Light Radio Show. I'm your host this evening, Stevie R. Butler from the state of North Carolina with my co-host, Tim Bench, from the state of Texas, from the state of Texas, Courtney Carruthers, from the state of Illinois, Steve Cordo, from the state of Illinois, Dr. Frank Washington, from the state of Florida, Clay Phillips, from the state of Georgia, Brian Christian Coleman, from the state of New Jersey, and Robert Lee Johnson, from the state of of Florida. Ladies and gentlemen, we are grateful that you are tuning into our radio broadcast this evening. This radio show is brought to you by loving and faithful members of the Churches of Christ. We've asked you to take out your Bibles and study along with us. We have a very exciting show planned for your spiritual enlightenment and your edification. If you'd like to contact us while we're on the air this evening, just give me a call to the live show at 713-955-0508. If you have any questions or comments for any of my co-hosts, you can send your emails to my new email address, butlersteve1009 at yahoo.com. Or you can call Stevie B Media Production Studio at 910-491-6405. Now, again, this program is brought to you by members of the Churches of Christ. And if you need any assistance in locating a congregation in your area, please feel free to contact us. Now, folks, get out your Bibles and stand along with us here on the Gospel Light Radio Show. You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. Before we go into our program for this evening, I would ask that you would bow with me in the word of prayer that we may thank God for this opportunity. Our most kind, gracious, loving Heavenly Father, the Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for allowing us to go through the various activities of the day and placing it on our heart. We are on this broadcast, and we are prepared now to present a portion of your holy and divine word. Father, we pray that you will be with my co-host, Courtney Carruthers, and Dr. Frank Washington on the show this evening as they break unto us the bread of life. And also my co-host, Robert Lee Johnson, as he answers the questions that are on the hearts of so many. We pray that you will bless them and their families that support their efforts, that they may continue to sow the seed of the kingdom. Father, we pray that you will bless our listeners this evening who are tuning in to this radio broadcast via Blog Talk Radio, as well as through social media. We pray that they may listen well and that their hearts may be pricked as they consider their eternal stance before you and their soul salvation. And it will cause them to ask the question, what must I do to be saved? Father, we thank you so much for sending your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, to die such a cruel death on Calvary's cross. For we realize that without such a sacrifice, we would not have a hope of eternal life. Father, even now, we ask that you forgive us for the transgressions of our own heart. We know our flesh is weak, and we often fall short of your will. Father, we pray that you will continue to bless us and keep us in love with all the days of our lives. And that we have been faithful unto death. Father, we pray that you would save us. For it's in Christ's name we do ask it all. Amen. 
You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning into the broadcast. Our speakers for this evening in the first segment, my co-host Courtney Carruthers. He serves as the evangelist for the Colonial Village Church of Christ in Chicago, Illinois. He'll be making his proclamation of the gospel of Christ. And in the second segment, I have a question from my shouted out platform on social media on Facebook. I'll be posing to my co-host, Robert Lee Johnson. He serves as the evangelist for the New Horizon Church of Christ in Lake City, Florida. He'll be answering our question in that segment. And then to close out the show, my co-host, Dr. Frank Washington, he serves with the West Broward Church of Christ there in Plantation, Florida. He'll be making this proclamation of the gospel of Christ to close out the show. So open up your Bibles and open your minds and let's have a great show. After the break, the next voice you hear will be that of my co-host, Courtney Carruthers. Enjoy the show. listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. Give your attention to the proclamation of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Now my co-host Courtney Carruthers and his subject, there is a bully in the church. Yes, yes. Thank you, Brother Stevie, for the opportunity to be a part of this, uh, this ministry 
to share the word of God to those that are in the faith, those that are seeking Jesus in their life and desiring to be saved from eternal damnation. We preach according to the Bible that one must hear the gospel, Romans 10, 17. One must believe the gospel, Hebrews 11, 1 and 11, 6. One must not only uh, hear the gospel, believe the gospel, but one must be willing to repent, that is to turn away from the regular elements of this life and turn on to Jesus Christ, who is our life, uh, according to Acts 2.38. Confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, Matthew 10, 32, and 33, and then be buried with him in the watery grave of baptism. Uh, according to Mark 16, 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, Romans 6, 1 through 4. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How is it then that we who are dead to sin live any longer than know ye not that so many of us have put on Christ? Uh, that have died, have put on Christ, uh, we are dead to sin, and so therefore, my hope, my hope this evening, for the time that I have, is to encourage the present believers of God to remain faithful unto death in Christ while using the church. Hear me now, while using the church as the spiritual. Uh, mode of transportation to heaven and those who are not yet members of the church to make Christ the center of their life before it's everlasting too late. And why am I saying this? As we are hearing news in relation to how we are able to start freely moving around the earth, the country, with masks, without masks, sitting so many feet apart, getting back into our church buildings, there is a great concern about people who have been hurt, um, um, have been maligned, gossip on. There are those who will never enter the church because they say, well, people in the church hurt one another. And I want to not just talk about what's keeping people from entering back into not just the building itself, but into the body of believers who can help build each other, that the walk to heaven will have some wounded saints. The committed Christian will have some, will have endured some cuts in life. The, the, the fruitful Christian will have moments of frustration but we ought to keep ourselves focused on Jesus. So when we talk on the subject, there is a bully in the church. It is not so much to focus on our bully, on those who are bullying people, but it's to focus on what strong Christians have done and will do. Stay faithful unto God. All right? So as I give this thought, the thought is to show that don't allow your bullying, don't allow the bullying of people to cause you to miss your blessing in the midst of the bullying. We ought to recognize that everything that happens in our life happens for a reason, but it's not to the point to cause us to leave God in the church, but it's to the point to recognize that God mm-hmm, is still in control. So let me read the passage to you, and then we'll get right into it. Third John, third John verse nine through twelve. Third John nine through twelve. And I'm going to make a few comments. Third, third John one through eight. But for the immediacy of our thought, is third John nine through twelve. The Bible says, "I wrote unto the church." But the atrophies who loveth to have the preeminence among them receiveth us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, crashing against us with malicious words, and not content therewith. Neither does he himself receive the brethren, 
and forbiddeth them that would and casteth them out of the church. Beloved, follow not which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God. But he that doeth evil hath not seen God. Verse 12, Demetrius has good report of all men, and of the truth itself, yea, and we also bear record, and ye know that our record is true. Prior to getting into this lesson, let me say this. As a minister, a brother in the church, and just a father, talking to people in various neighborhoods and states or cities that I have lived in about church, coming to church, coming to worship. People will use the negativity of what they have heard folk have done to others in the church and say, if I got to go to heaven in that church, I might as well not even go. So I want to bring forth a positive resolve that no matter, and that, and that positive resolve begins with this statement. Everything worth having in life will encounter difficulties. Being in the church does not mean it's going to be a hop, skip, and a jump to glory. You will have some trips. You will have some stumbles. You will have some, some faint moments. But hold on to God's on changing hands. So let's talk about this then. There's a bully in the church. The idea of a bully is to hide their inadequacies, and by doing this, they hope to, one, avoid facing up to their inadequacies and doing something about it. Two, reduce their fear for being seen for what they are, namely a weak, inadequate, and often incompetent individual. Three, divert attention away from their inadequacy. From understanding the ideal purpose of a bully, it is necessary to describe in a detailed thought the ne- definition of a bully. According to traditional definitions, we ascribe the word bully to anyone, here it is, who uses a position of relative power. Relative power. Relative power is seen in leadership, family, workplace, and church. This relative power is to direct negative intent against another person when those who are trying to uphold their power as a bully seemingly are threatened to lose their power to those who use relations for building up and not up people and not bullying people away from those who can take away their, their, their carnal or worldly power. People in position that have a mindset of ethics, godly ethics, do not use power to rule. They use power to build or to encourage folk to move ahead in life and or to face their impossible future. Let me slow that down. The idea of the word impossible future means that something is, is in the eyes of a person that they desire to have or to become, but they look at it as being too impossible to encounter. A true leader in position in the church will say it may look impossible, but with all things, God, it is possible with God and they find ways, they find directions, they find avenues to encourage people to accomplish their impossible future. The opposite of that leader is one who does not encourage the church to overcome or to uh, 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 take advantage of their impossible future because if they do, then they will outgrow that leader but a normal-minded leader and member of the church will always want people around them in relationship to achieve greater things, perhaps even better than themselves. So here, and given this definition, um, bullying can be considered as a relational aggressor. Relational aggression takes form as verbal threats and abuse. We'll see that in Third John. 
Relational bullies exercise the negative intent by directing hurtful statements to their victims in a greater significance, taking, talking about the victims to others. This type of aggression uses the threat of social isolation to hurt the victim. The bully's advantage resides in the value the victim places on belonging to a family, school, workplace, or other groups. Bullies have no corresponding fear of social isolation. The less the people that they uh, are, have power over, and they and they he, and that bully that bully that bully believes that those people depend on them, and other folk come by and say, "Look, you can be free from this." You can think of your own. You can worship. You can grow on your own with the help of God. You don't need him all the time. That person feels threatened and do not want someone to free people beyond that bully's uh, expectations. Therefore, they do not value relationship and therefore perceive them as having nothing to lose. Interdependent relationships signifies weakness. I don't need them. I don't need that. I I can do it all by myself. It's not a matter of strength. It's weakness because when a person tries to do something, always would need someone else to guide them, not to try to say better, but more experience to show them how where they can get, how they can get to their point of becoming a stronger believer. Someone will, uh, a, a poem or a thought goes like this, no man is an island. Mm. And no man stands alone. Each man's joy is joy to me, and each man's grief is my own. From this definition of a bully, I now would like to turn our attention to the targets of a bully. Targets of bullying usually have these qualities. The quality is, one, popularity. This stimulates jealousy in the least less than popular bully. Two, competence. This stimulates envy in the less than competent bully. Intelligence and intellect, honesty and integrity, which bullies despise. You are trustworthy, trusting, conscientious, loyal, and dependable. A well-developed integrity, which you are not unwilling to compromise. You are always willing to go the, that extra mile and expect others to do the same. Christians encourage Christians to go the extra mile for the Lord in morality and also in ministry. Successful, tenacious, determined, courageous, having fortitude. Idealistic, optimistic, always working for improvement and betterment of self, family, and the church. This is what bu- bullies hate to see in positive members who have freed mem- other members to learn, love, and live for Christ apart from them. Leadership in the church and leadership in families, leadership in schools and workplaces are not to keep people in prison, but to inspire them to reach their impossible, to accomplish their impossible future. Uh, positive folks in the church has a sensitivity, has sensitivity. This is a constellation of value to be cherished, including empathy concern for others, respect, and tolerance. People who are opposite of bullying are slow to anger. They are helpful, always willing to share knowledge and experience. Irrepressible, wanting to tackle and correct injustice whenever you see it. Now, as we talk about this, we want to use these concepts to analyze the context. Of Third John nine through twelve, the main objective of this article is to bring awareness to the believers. Or the main objective of this thought and article or or teaching is to bring awareness to the believers as to what their bullies are and their aspirations. A quick note about the aspiration is this: relational bullies do not form deep friendship. If you cross them, they have nothing to do with you. So when people talk about church hurt. They have to realize that everyone in the church is not about trying to hurt folks, but people who feel inadequate, insufficient, um, have no, con- no, no, no ability to achieve, they got to use pseudo power by, by 
making other people feel weak to depend on them. But a strong leader, a strong member, a faithful person in the church uses God's power to build up other folk. Now, let me do this. A quick note about this inspirational uh, inspiration is this. Relational bullies do not form a deep relationship. When they do, they usually choose a very non-aggressive peer. Being a friend to such an aggressor puts one in the light of a complicit aggressor. For example, you may not bully others nor suffer others to bully you, but perhaps you participate in aggression as an observer and use the passiveness of your role to rationalize your complicity. In other words, so as we talk about geography as the bully in the church, the scriptures commit our attention to the following characteristics of a church bully, and these characteristics are as follows. One, the atrophy's bullying characteristic is that of pride. This is out of, this instead of giving preeminence to Jesus Christ, Colossians 1.18, he claimed it for himself. The Bible says in 3 John 9, I wrote unto the church, but the atrophy who loveth to have the preeminence among them receiveth us not. Bullying takes something and make it their own when it's really they're not so that other folk can follow them. The atrophy's bullying characteristic is that of pride. Instead of giving the preeminence to Jesus Christ, Colossians 118, he claimed it for himself. He had the final say, so about everything in the church, and his decisions were determined by one thing. Who what will you do what will this do for the atrophy? Anything that was to happen in the church had to benefit the atrophy. If you seem to be smarter, if you seem to be more successful, if you seem to have a better strategy, if you seem to be bringing people together beyond the atrophy's intention and desire, he will kick you out or isolate you and try to punish those who do not follow him. Jesus Christ, according to the teachings of Paul in Ephesians 2, let us know that in Ephesians chapter 2, that when people come together in the church, they come to be edified, encouraged, and exhorted to keep fighting the good fight of faith. But I like what Ephesians chapter 2 says, that in verse 4, but God, everything that happens is but is because of but God. Every time when a person changes their life is because of but God. Every time when a person loves their neighbor uh, and, lo- and can forgive people and can keep unity in the church and can increase the finance to spread the gospel of Jesus, it's not because of an elder, own elder. It's not because of a deacon. It's not because of a family. It's because of but God. And we need more members to concentrate on their but God and not on their bully. We need more members to concentrate on but God who can open a door in the middle of a, uh, in, a in the midst of all closed doors, who can put a water in the desert, who can put light in the tunnel. The people who follow a bully will only follow a bully because the bully will say well, there's light at the end of the tunnel. But when you follow your but God, you don't just see a light at the end of the tunnel. You see a light in the tunnel. I wish I had somebody to touch their Bible, to touch their phone, or to touch the or ring their uh, to ring blow the horn in the car and you listen because some people ain't coming back to church. Some people say I'm tired of being hurt. But the problem is is that we pay too much attention to our bullies and not enough attention to our but God. Oh what if what if Moses would have went to uh, Pharaoh and bowed down to Pharaoh, but he he relied on but God. His but God brought him to realize that with whatever in his hand, God could make a difference. That whenever he needed God, all he was to say is, uh, I am, brought sent me. I'm all right about it. So I want to encourage us to realize that when you come to the church and you want to give your life to Christ, you will have folk who will try to hurt you. You will have folk who will try to hold you back. But we are not called to always have sunshine, but we're called to recognize the sun in the midst of our storm. And who brings the sunshine? Is that all right? So when we say, but God, 
but God who is rich in mercy. I'm glad he used the word mercy because mercy helps us to concentrate on the one who takes away the pain. And I know some of you have had some pain in your life, but because God who is rich in mercy, you can draw from it. You can draw from your torment. You can draw from mercy. You can draw mercy from God when you're tormented. You can draw mercy from God when you're taunted. You can draw mercy from God when folk put you down to help your mind to stay hopeful in the midst of horror and hurt and sadness and disruption because God can always make a difference. Now watch this. God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, when folk don't love you, God has, God's great love is everywhere. His love is so great that it's not just a popular statement. It is a powerful structure. It's not a popular statement. It's a powerful structure. God is about structure. And when you go through some pain in the church and some hurt in the church, and some meet some bullies in the church, and folk isolate you. God has a remnant that He can put you around to keep you focused on the fact that you ain't you ain't there to please man. You're there to please God. Rick, great love, we're with you, loved us. Even when we are dead in sin, one thing bullies like to do is they like to bring up your past. Oh, everybody got a past, but folk want to bullies will use your past just to put you down. But God, God. Realize that when we are dead in sin, that he has brought, made us alive together with Christ. And it's by grace I'm saved. It's by grace you're saved. And because of that, he raised us up together. Now, watch this. I, 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 want, I don't want you to have an earthquake. I don't want you to have a spirit of earthquake. But watch this. God, do not put people together in the church who will cause you pain. He takes folk. Who, are, who have experienced pain of all sorts of life. He takes folk who, are, who, are, who recognize that they ain't always been good. He takes folk who, who recognize that they too can still make a mistake. He takes folk and sit them together for what purpose? To engage them, to encourage them that, yes, yeah, I fall, he's still going to keep me in the faith. If I grow weary, he's going to give me grace to walk. If I stumble, he's going to give me strength in the mind to get up and brush it off. Sometimes we, we, we don't learn to brush stuff off, but we got to have a mindset that God gives us the power in our heart to keep focusing on God. And all right? Has, and when that happens, he raises us up to sit together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So, therefore, the idea now is this, that bullying, the atrophies, bullying characteristics that are pride. He did not want John, a prominent apostle preacher, come in and to help encourage the saints to love God better. He wanted control. He wanted to control everything. That that is when the church would begin to do, that when he wanted to control everything. And when we have folks who are trying to control everything and do not let God control it, that is when the church will begin to decline decline in spiritual inspiration and in spiritual involvement. I want us to realize something, that the Bible tells us in 2 Thessalonians, the Bible tells us in 2 Thessalonians, I mean 1 Thessalonians, in verse 615, see that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good. How do you stop your bullying how do you make your bully get tired of bullying you? You keep doing good. Just shake it off. Just pray about it. I want you to realize that bullies in the church who hurt folk only do it because they do not have the tenets of, uh, of true relationship with God. When one has true relationship with God, the one, they do not render evil. When one has a relationship with God, they learn how to rejoice ever more. And I'm not talking about being happy because happiness is based on what's happening in your life. But I'm talking about folks who know how to rejoice all the time, rejoice evermore, rejoice when you're down, rejoice when you're up. They take the ability to realize that rejoicing is a mindset that says, whatever comes my way, God's going to see me through. I wish I had somebody to just say God's going to see me through because if you understand that God can see you through, you can rejoice. And the idea of the word rejoice 
take the idea of an athlete who is agile. He is able to find ways to keep moving closer to God. And as the church is the bride of Christ, and I've got some bullies in the church, I know how to say, excuse me, I'm trying to get close to Jesus, and I'm not going to let you paralyze my mind because you don't have a heaven nor a hell. Therefore, I learned to rejoice. It's an ideal thing. I can celebrate in the cold. I can confess in the dark. I can I can see in the jailhouse because you're not going to steal my joy. Is that all right? And then the second thing is pray without ceasing. That don't mean you always going to pray, but you have a, you have in the back of your throat the ability to offer something to God when things don't go right, things are right, things are just neutral. You have the ability to say, bully, you're not going to do this. I'm go- you're not going to turn me away. You're not going to frustrate me. I'm going to pray evermore. Now, let me say this. Now, not only that, but watch this here. Number two, the atrophies reject positive persuasion, according to verse 9. In order for Diotrephes to maintain his power, he had to reject any person such as John from coming in and giving the people of God some hope. What is hope? The letter hope, the letter H in hope is heart. The letter O in hope is on. The letter P in hope is positive. The letter E in hope is expectation. Diotrephes knew that if John came in and caused the people to set their heart on positive expectation, he will be considered not as important as he'd like to be. This is what John did in John third John one verse one. Third John one verse one. This is what John did to he says these words in third John one. Let me uh get back to my text here. In third John one uh verse one, the Bible says, The elder unto the well beloved Gaius, who I love in the truth. Beloved, now this is the hope. Whenever you have true people in the church that can take your mind off your hurt, your sorrow, listen, do things like this. Do this. Verse 2 says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health. The word prosper simply means having a good journey. We need more folk in the church to help people to prosper to have a good journey towards heaven. Amen. Uh, too, we have too many things that are sidetracking us, causing us to exit off the road to heaven. But John says, I want you to prosper. I want you to have a good journey. Now watch this. Not only a good journey, but I want you to be in health, even as they shall, pro- even as thy soul prospers. In other words, I don't even want, I, I just don't want your mind to be on a good journey, but I want you to remain healthy physically, mentally, spiritually towards heaven. Our singing, our preaching, our teaching engages people to have a good journey. That's why I come to church, because I'm going to have a, pros- I'm going to be prosperous. Because trying to get to heaven, I get I have some setbacks sometimes. But if I'm healthy, I can keep on keeping on with Jesus. Just to, and everyone who's in the church, knowing that folk are hurt in family, have lost loved ones, have had sickness, have diseases, have had some hor- horrible marriages, have, are coming out of some child abuse situations. They don't want to come to a church where folk are picking others. They want to come to a church where folks say, you're going to have a good journey on from the rest of your life because you are in a good place. And then number three is this. Well, we can, well, let me finish this, verse 9, that a bully is not only, is only successful, he can influence people with abrasive negative power. But when he can use abusive, when he can use abrasive negative power, he then would be looked upon as the answer for everything that he says would not work. But John's purpose for coming was to encourage the people of God to have a mind of their own so they can concentrate on Jesus and not depend solely on man for direction. The purpose of leadership, um, the purpose of leadership in, within the church is to engage the people of God to reach a level of confidence that says, I can do this by the strength of Jesus. Paul says, I can do all things 
through Christ which strengthens me. And the word strengthens endodunamis. Endodunamis simply means having the mindset that is empowered to overcome, to turn my jailhouse into, a, into an evangelistic opportunity, to turn the hospital into a hope of salvation for others, to turn uh, disunity into a matter of developing people to become more unified in the purpose of God. Bullies in the church look after people that are weaker than they to make themselves feel good. Let me close it by saying look, then that a lady by the name of Erica Campbell um, breaks down the exact definition of church hurt. She says that church hurt happens when you have been a victim of total abuse, verbal, physically, mentally, and socially. And that sometimes happens in the church. Well, how do we overcome bullying? Number one, know your enemy. Everybody in the church ain't for you, but know your enemy. Know that your enemy, First Peter 5, 8, walketh about as a roaring lion, seeking who he may devour. Now, he can't hurt you, but he can sheer growl at you. Do you not know that it is the female lion, it is the lioness that hunt? In order for the lioness to be successful in catching the hunt, the, their prey, the lion himself got a roar. They're victim to the lioness. You got folk who are trying to war you away from God. That's the only thing they can do. Then number two, know your enemy. Ephesians six twelve says, Ephesians six lets us know that we don't fight against we don't we fight against flesh and we don't fight against flesh and blood, blood but we fight against weakness and power in high places. Then number two, keep short. Keep short aggression. Keep your aggression short. In other words, Ephesians 4, 26 says, be angry, comma, and sin not. The reason why many people are leaving the church when they're hurt, because they forget that even Peter says, we are blessed when we suffer for the cause of Christ. And as we suffer for the cause of Christ, people who are not trying to live like Christ will cause you more pain as well. But do not keep a long list of what folk have done to you. Because the more you think about it, the more you treat, you will not allow your scars to be healed. Then lastly, don't be afraid of, a, of, a, of accepting of, a, of your accountability. How, what is your accountability? What is your, what is your, what, what, what could you have done to prevent things from happening? What can you do further in your life with God and in the church to stop people from hurting you? Don't always act like the victim, but act like become the victor. Don't always act like the loser, but become liberated in Jesus Christ because that's what Satan wants you to do. He wants you to feel down. He wants you to feel defeated. He wants you to face difficulty with no hope of overcoming it. So that he can put people in your life to say, see, God told you not to come. And they're always saying, people are going to talk about you whether you're in the church or not. And so as we get ready to get more engaged back in the church building to encourage people to look up to Jesus, don't you be the one to say, I'm not going back because church hurts. Church doesn't hurt. Satan hurts. Satan used people who are not close to Christ. I pray to God that something's been said to cause us to realize that just as John said God would get him, God would get him back, you have to realize, too, that God will fight your battle still. May God bless you and recognize, yes, there's bullies in the church, but you better turn your bully. Do not allow your bully to keep you away. Turn your, allow your bullies to make your belief stronger in God, that he will fight your battle still. God bless you, and may he bless you real well. Thank you. You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. Is your congregation in need of lending for a building or expansion project? As your partner and advocate, Diversified Financial Network will take the time to understand your unique situation and develop a financing solution that meets your specific need. It's an exciting time for your congregation. And what you need is a company with expertise in church financing early in the process. 
Call us today at 1-866-513-6665 or visit us at www.diversifiedfinancegroup.com. These announcements are for the events and activities in the Churches of Christ. If you'd like to have your events or activities announced on this radio broadcast, please contact me at Stevie B. Me Production Studio at 910-491-6405. Or send your emails to my new email address, butlersteve1009 at yahoo.com. Due to the coronavirus pandemic outbreak, I will not be making any public announcements until further notice regarding public meetings or assemblies, but I will be making announcements about the events and activities happening on social media. But I do have a update for the congregation in Fayetteville, North Carolina, the Helen Street Church of Christ. They have started meeting on Sunday mornings for worship service at uh 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and Bible class after their worship services, but they will not be holding any evening services or Wednesday night services at the building. They will be doing their, conducting their services on Zoom as well. The Thursday night from 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I'm sorry, 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time and 9 p.m. Central Standard Time and 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, there'll be a nationwide gospel call that's sponsored by the Church of Christ in Highland Heights from Houston, Texas. And the telephone number to this gospel call is 857-216-6700. And access code is 328-497. This is a nationwide outreach to those who are not members of the Churches of Christ. And the speakers will be presenting a basic salvation message for them to learn what they must do in order to be saved, as well as information regarding the churches of Christ. And in addition, it is intended to edify and strengthen the faith of those who are Christians. On Tuesday evening, the Dale Craft Church of Christ from San Antonio, Texas, presents the Women's Virtual Bible Class. And this Bible class will be held at 6.30 p.m. Central Standard Time on www.zoom.com. And the class ID number is 821-3692-8262. Daily at 6 a.m. Central Standard Time, the Ladies in Christ prayer line hosted by the Church of Christ in Lafayette, Louisiana. And the telephone number to this prayer line is 605-472-5203. And the access code is 514-859. My co-host here on the Gospel Light Radio Show, Steve Cordo, has a new book entitled God's Grace in You, and you can order this book from the 21st Century Christian Catalog. There will be a spring-summer series every fourth Wednesday of the month at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. There will be a preacher's panel discussion joined Minister Michael Crusoe as he moderates a series of discussions featuring, featuring seasoned preachers in the Brotherhood of the Churches of Christ. And the topic of the discussion is expanding the role of women in Christian worship, a word from the Lord. And just a program reminder, Stevie B's Media Production Presents, we're airing live shows here on Blog Talk Radio. The first, no, Tuesday, every Tuesday from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 5 to 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And each week on that broadcast, I have a guest speaker from the Brotherhood of the Churches of Christ who will be presenting from the Word of God. And we also have a community corner segment that segment is designed for small business owners and entrepreneurs who have products and services for our community. Also, I have three co-hosts on that show. Lou Gilbert, who's the evangelist for the Overbrook Park Church of Christ there in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And my newest co-host, Shauna Otis from the Greyway Church of Christ there in Nashville, Tennessee. She has her team the mid-tennessee singles ministry out of nashville tennessee and then we have my newest co-host isa mullins he serves the helen street church of christ here in fayetteville north carolina then on thursday evening each week from 6 to 8 p.m eastern standard time 5 to 7 p.m central standard time i'll be hosting a live show the gospel light radio show and I have eight co-hosts on that show who will be presenting messages from the Word of God. And each week, I have two of my co-hosts on the air with me. I'm also taking a question from my social media platform on Facebook that I'll be posing to one of my co-hosts on this live show. 
And then on Friday night at our new time from 9 to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 8 to 10 p.m. Central Standard Time, I'll be hosting a live show, Stevie B's Acapella Gospel Music Blast Radio Show. And on this show, I'm playing some of the world's greatest acapella gospel music artists, the sweet sounds of voices. And I'm also have the Story Glory segment where every first Friday of the month I'm uh, interviewing the artists that we're playing on this radio show. And I'm also debuting new music and featuring old music. And on this, on next Friday night, on May 28th, we'll be debuting some new music from Eric Irvin C. Jackson from Wesley Chapel, Florida. He'll be deb- releasing two of his new singles, or debuting two of his new singles on that broadcast. And also, we're doing the Top 20 Countdown show on this Friday night. I'm counting down my Top 20 acapella gospel songs for the month of May. My on-demand episode, if you can't catch any of these live shows, where are you getting your favorite podcast from? There's just a variety of platforms that you can use where you can pull up these on-demand episodes for the various podcasts. And if you just put in your search bar, Stevie B Media Production, you'll see all of the shows that we're producing here on a weekly basis. And some of the major ones I always like to announce are Spotify, Apple, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, YouTube, just to name a few. Also, I have a new sponsorship manager. My sponsorship manager is Michelle Marco from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And if you'd like to become a sponsor for any of these radio shows, just give her a call at 954-687-4705. I'd like to give a shout-out to all of my sponsors. We certainly appreciate everyone who's sponsoring these shows. Sharon Norwood from Chicago, Illinois, Bethesda Memorial, Crew Director of Crematory Services from DeSoto, Texas, and Stanley Phillips from Little Rock, Arkansas, and Yvonne Blazing Cracker Gooch from Nashville, Tennessee, Melvin Jackson from High Point, North Carolina, Marquise Hallman from Charlotte, North Carolina, and Stephanie Booker Wilson from Greensboro, North Carolina, Diversified Financial Network, LLC, from Dallas, Texas, the owner is Marcus Charlotte Carroll, and Ordained Faith Publishing from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. The three E's of Stevie B's Media Production, it is the objective of this broadcast. We want to educate, we want to edify, and we want to encourage you in a study of God's Word. And that will conclude our program announcements. Our shout it out question is coming up next. Stay tuned to the Gospel Life Radio Show. You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. the 
Listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. Shout it out, question. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the portion of the broadcast where I have a question from my social media platform called Shout It Out that we want to pose to one of my co-hosts. And we also want to encourage our listeners to join that group on social media and get involved in those biblical discussions. Now, my co-host that I will be talking to that's going to be answering this question is Robert Lee Johnson. Now, Robert Lee Johnson, how you doing, my brother? Doing fine, my brother. How are you? I'm doing just fine. Now, we got a doozy of a question for you on the show this evening. Now, this question comes from um, comes. I want to say this is an anonymous query, but I don't believe it's an anonymous query. This question comes from, yes, an anonymous query from the state of North Carolina. But before I read the question, the scriptural text that's used for this question is a scriptural reference, rather, is John chapter 14 and verse 12. Let me read that first, and then I will ask you the question. John chapter 14 and verse 12, the text says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, this is Jesus Christ talking, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And the question is, what is the greater work that the Lord is referring to here in John 14 and verse 12? What say you to this question? Well, thank you, Stevie. I'm happy to be here and to... Uh, have this opportunity to be on the program. It's a great program, and uh, many people love to <clears throat> participate uh, on the program. And 
and to be a part of it. And I want to thank you for allowing me to be on the program and to have something to say about these important biblical issues. Well, in John 14, uh, Jesus said, in answer to this uh, question, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. And then Christ responded by saying, And greater works than these shall he do. And then Jesus adds, Because I go unto my Father. Now, inquiring minds would really like to know. Number one, what are these greater works? Number two, how could the apostles or disciples of Christ, how could they in any way do greater works than the master? I mean, when you think of the resurrection of Lazarus from the dead, (laughs) and not only did Jesus get him up, remember what the people said. They said, Lord, (laughs) you know, (laughs) Sometimes when you go to an event and you get there a little late, people say, man, you 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 too late. And seemingly they thought that about Christ because listen at their words. They said, Lord, by, by now he's stinking. He stinketh, Lord. By now he stinketh. That's what they said about Lazarus. He is a stinking dead person. What can you do, Lord? What can you do about a stinking dead person? Lord, by now, he stinketh, so they said. So uh, when we look at uh, the Bible, Christ said, verily, verily. Now, with these words, Jesus turned from replying to Philip and included them all. You know, Judas was not there in the glorious promises about uh, that he was about to give to them. And so uh, these words are worthy of, of hearing. When you hear Christ say, verily, verily, you better stop and listen. Now, greater works than these shall you do. That's what Jesus said. And Christ said that about the works uh, that the apostles would do. And let me just say this, that it is difficult to know exactly by what Jesus meant when he made or gave this statement. For no miracle could be greater than raising Lazarus from the dead. No work could be greater than that of the enabling act a redemption on the cross. That's what Jesus performed. He brought salvation to us and for us. One writer noted, greater works would then relate to the wider opportunities which the disciples would have when Jesus returned to the Father. It would have to have such a meaning because if Christ raised one from the dead and the apostles raised one from the dead, then how could the apostles' work be greater uh, than the work that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ performed? So how could their miracles really be greater or better than the miracles of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? So it's a little difficult to uh, really figure out exactly what is meant here, but we can come up uh, with uh, some guidelines or some thoughts that perhaps would be helpful in answering uh, this 
question. Uh, greater works would then relate to the wider opportunities which the apostles would have when Jesus returned to the Father. Remember, he had to go back to the Father. He came and did what God asked of him to do. But Christ had to return to the Father. And then he said to his apostles, I will not dare leave you by yourself. He said, I'm going to give you a comforter. John chapter 14 and verse number 26. And John 16 verses 12 and 13. The comforter was the Holy Ghost. According to Scripture, John 16, 12, and 13, he would guide them in all the things that they needed to know. He would reveal unto them the revelation of God, John 14, 26. He would even show them things that were to come. And so I think we have to look at it in that particular purview in order to have a chance to understand what these words mean. Now, David Liscombe said that during the life of Jesus on earth, his work was restricted to the limitations of his physical presence. But after he ascended to the Father uh, and the Holy Spirit came uh, in the name of Christ, a greater and more extended work would be done uh, by the fuller inspiration of the apostles and the more extended mission they had to feel. So, so I don't think in comparison to what Christ uh, did, can we say the apostles did greater? They did not. Uh, but remember, Jesus worked locally and perform great deeds. We know he went to some other areas, but Christ did not go in the mission that he sent the apostles on. I think that means their work was greater. For the Bible says, the Bible says, uh, that he told them to go ye into all of the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. They harvested greater results than the Lord. Not that they were better, but they had better opportunities, and there were more of them working under the power and the auspices of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says on the day of Pentecost alone that 3,000 souls were saved by the preaching of the gospel. I think that's what is meant there, that God would work through them and with them to accomplish the cause of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Not in the quality of the work, but in the fact that they will represent God and Christ and the fact that they went everywhere preaching the gospel, which Christ did not do. He sent the apostles to accomplish that task. And so the very nature of Jesus' appearance on earth required miraculous manifestations of his power. But those miracles, wonderful as they were, had an inherent limitation. Jesus' miracle of feeding the 5,000 was as nothing compared to the feeding of all the populations of the earth throughout history through the operation of God's natural law. Similarly, the miracle of creating Adam and Eve was as nothing compared to the perpetuation of humanity, humanity through the ages by means of the natural laws of procreation. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful is all we can say. 
just so the miracles attending the establishment of the church or the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven on earth, and even including the miracles wrought by Jesus are as nothing compared to the salvation of countless millions of men through the operation of God's spiritual laws, which were set in motion by the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, they were greater, but not that they were better than Christ. They were greater because they were found to be within uh, the provision of the will of God. And God sent them to go and do the things that he commanded of them to do. The superiority of the spiritual over the physical is evidenced by Jesus' words. And we read in the Bible so many times where Christ makes reference to the work that they would do. They were afraid. They were fearful. But Jesus told them, look, I'm not going to leave you alone. I'll send the comforter. He will be your leader. He will be your guide. And the Bible says he'll show you things that were to come to pass. 3,000 souls were converted from death to life on the first Pentecost after the resurrection of Christ. And this surpassed anything that was possible through the preaching of Jesus. Because God had ordained that Christ would return to the Father. And Jesus said the other day, because I go to the Father, the greater works wrought by the apostles did not take place in spite of Jesus going to the Father, but because he did go to the Father. He told them, I'm I'm not going to leave you by yourself. I'll not leave you alone. He knew their hearts. And by the way, God knows everything that's in your heart. He knows you're fearful of some things. He knows you're wondering if he'll be around when you have to meet with the greatest tragedy of your life. He knows the hurt and the pain that you feel because sometimes as humans we get wrapped up in things that are so hard to get through. But I hear him saying to them and to us, he said, I not leave you alone. And the Bible teaches us that he never did. And so in John 14 and 13, I have to close this out. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And so if we want to be blessed today, tonight, we have to do as the apostles did. Christ said, do it. In my name. There are people doing many wonderful works today. There are some people that spend all of their time working for worldly endeavors. I know they may be good endeavors, but they are worldly endeavors if they're not spiritual endeavors and if they don't concern Jesus Christ. I could build a memorial for my mother and spend all of my time working on that. That would be something good to do, but that's not the best thing that we can do. Because the spiritual work of God must get done and somebody in the church must get converted to do that work. And so as best as I can today, I'm saying that these works that the apostles did were not a better quality of works than Jesus performed, but they were of the nature of, Uh, of spirituality, and God allowed them to have many opportunities to go. The Bible says that that they went and preached the gospel on one occasion. 5,000 men were saved alone. 
through the preaching of the gospel. That, I believe, falls within the sphere of what is being uh, broached here in this conversation tonight. On the day of Pentecost, Peter and the apostles preached. 3,000 souls were saved. God working with the apostles and the apostles working with them. And I'm just so thankful that we can have a part in this wonderful work tonight. I close. The Bible says in 2 uh, Corinthians chapter 5, I want to go there as we come to a conclusion. Hopefully I've said something that would be of interest to you uh, on this particular subject. And so uh, they were workers with God. And uh, they followed the will of, of Christ. And God worked with them. In 2 Corinthians 5, the Bible says, To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, uh, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now, then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. And if you're not a Christian tonight, in the words of the great Apostle Paul, give your life to him and walk with him and do those things that are well pleasing and acceptable in the sight of God. No, they were not greater works regarding the quality of what they did. But the Bible, listen, when you are in the will of God, you are doing great works. And God will bless you with those works. Don't pat yourself on the back or on the shoulder thinking that it's all you. The Bible says God was with them, working with them, and they worked with God. The apostle said, to the Corinthians, do not receive the grace of God in vain. And I say to you tonight, do not receive the grace of God in vain. Hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Believe it with all of your heart. Repent of your sins. Confess faith in Jesus. And get baptized for the remission of sins. And allow God to do greater works through you. Thank you. I hope I've been a help uh, some regarding this question. Thank you so much, Stevie. God bless. Shout it out question. You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. Flowing down the river of
You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. Give your attention to the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, my co-host, Dr. Frank Washington, and his subject, How Far Do You Want to Go? Good evening, brothers and sisters, visitors, and friends. It is great to be um, here with you today. I pray that you had a great day, uh, a blessed day. I want to thank uh, Brother Courtney Carruthers for talking about that bully. He's revealing that bully uh, in our churches, and that's very important. And Brother uh, uh, Brother Lee, uh, Robert Lee Johnson, uh, on his question, answered it very well. I thank you, brothers, for your uh, tenacity in uh, in your pr- proclamation uh, of Jesus Christ. Tonight, I want to talk to you uh, concerning. Uh, an Old Testament uh, lesson, Second Kings chapter two, uh, verse number one through verse eighteen. I'm not going to go through all of that, but I just want to get to the highlight part, and that is, you know, why did Elisha insist three times to go with Elijah to his fiery chariot ride, but all of the sons of the prophets insisted on standing some distance away. Uh, I, I think that this morning, or, or I'm sorry, tonight, uh, we're going to look at the life of a man who was committed being a prophet for God. His name was Elisha. About three years before, God had selected Elisha to be the great Elijah's replacement. Now, we're not told anything of what happened during that three years or so. All we're told is that now Elijah is leaving. He's about to be taken up in a fiery chariot, and everybody seems to know it. Now, according to the text, Elijah began his journey in Gilgal and went to Bethel and then on to Jericho and finally to the Jordan River to be caught up to be with God. Now, as the story unfolds and as Elijah is leaving Gilgal, he turns to Elisha and he says, And he's very polite about this. He says, please stay here. But Elisha refuses and says, as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. And this happened over and over again, this conversation and dialogue between Elijah and Elisha. And at each community, Elijah uh, turns to Elisha and says, please stay here. Each time, Elisha's response was, I'm not leaving you. Finally, Elijah just gives up and lets Elisha go all the way with him to his destination. Now, track this. Elisha was willing to go as far as he needed to go to be in the presence of God. Now, the sons of the prophets, uh, it would appear that they only wanted to go a certain way. Distance. Uh, the Bible says they stood at some distance from them as they both were standing at the Jordan. Well, I, I think it's kind of clear. It comes down to this. They didn't want to go that far, and they didn't want to get that close. And when it comes to following God, that's what happens to some people. They don't want to go too far or get too close. A man named T.F. Tinney uh, once said, and I quote, Jesus fed 5,000, but only 500 followed him after lunch. He had 12 disciples, but only three went further into the garden, and only one stood with him at the cross. The closer you get to the cross, the smaller the crowd, end quote. One of the greatest revelations, my friends, you will ever receive is to know who to partner with in life. Wrong people can destroy you. Wrong people can devastate you. But the right people can accelerate you. Now, Elijah and Elisha had a unique relationship. Elisha saw something in Elijah that he desired. He saw and respected the blessing 
of the anointing of Elijah, listen to me. You will never receive anything from a man or woman of God unless you respect the blessing that rests upon them. You can't learn from somebody you resent. You can only learn from somebody you admire. And I know, and I know that's right. Elisha saw something in Elijah that he desired and was determined to stay in that relationship with him regardless, uh, regardless of the cost. Uh, When Elijah told Elisha to stay in Bethel, he refused. When he was told to stay in Jericho, he refused. He went with him all the way to the other side of the Jordan River. Each time Elijah told Elisha to stay somewhere, Elisha responded again by saying, as the Lord lives, as as your soul lives, I will not leave you. But each time the sons of the prophets told Elisha that the Lord was about to take away his master, he told them, hold your peace, chill out, it's going to be all right. Elisha was determined to stay connected to Elijah. When Elijah smoked the Jordan River with his mantle and the waters parted, Elisha was still there. And Elisha took his mantle, Second Kings 2.8, he says, Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smoked the waters, and they were divided hither and thither so that the two uh, went together on dry ground. God was about to do something new in the life of Elisha. But he first had to take him to a place where the crowd could not go. The same is still true with Christians today. Every time God is about to do something new in your life, whether it be receiving a new blessing, going to the next level of your ministry, or taking you to or into a season of healing and prosperity, God will lead you to a place where the crowd can't go. When God was going to do something new in Moses' life, he called him to the backside of the desert. Be with me now. When Jacob was Uh, At a point of change in his life He found himself alone Wrestling with God Everybody will not be able To go where God is going To take you my friend Everybody will not be able to hear What God is about to speak to you Everybody will not be able To see what God is about to show you Some people Will not be able to handle the blessing And the prosperity that God is about to put on you This is why God is Taking you to a place where the crowd can't follow This is why he's leading you to the other side of Jordan God, my friend, is trying to position you For what he is getting ready to do in your life If you are not careful, people, you will mess up And sometimes we blame the devil for a lot of things that uh, he has nothing to do with Amen, I said it. Uh, It's not necessarily the devil that has messed up a lot of Christians. It's the people that they associate with that's messing them up. People will mess with your blessing. They will stop your blessing. They'll even keep you from reaching the next level of your ministry. They and, and there are four kinds of people. Pay attention. There are four kinds of people. There are people who add to your life. And there are those who subtract. There are people who divide. And then there are those who multiply. Remove the people who subtract and divide in your life. They are going to be the ones who slow your progress and possibly even stop you from becoming what God has destined for you to become. It's time to reevaluate and see if the people around you can handle what God is about to do in your life. How will they respond when you enter into the next level of your destiny or of your ministry? Just because someone says that they are with you today does not mean they'll be with you tomorrow. Amen. As the old saying goes, they smile in your face, but they'll stab you in the back. Amen. Hallelujah. People who may tell you they love you today, but that does not mean that they won't turn against you tomorrow. Joseph's brothers had no problem with him the day he was born. In fact, they celebrated his birth. But once they realized he was their father's favorite child, and when their father gave him that expensive coat, 
the one of many, many colors. Uh, the brothers became full of jealousy. Then when he began to share his dreams and uh, with them, uh, their jealousy turned into hatred, and uh, they wanted to kill him. Some people have no problem with you as long as you do not have a dream or a vision. As long as you live uh, in the world of average, everything's all right. But once you decide to move into the world of greatness, it'll rise up against you and even try to destroy and, and destroy you. Somebody holler at me now. Uh, remember your destiny is never tied to anyone who can walk away from you. If they leave, rejoice and be glad because God is about to do something new in your life. Uh, I think T.D. Jake said once, I quote, uh, the gift of goodbye is the 10th spiritual gift. Well, I guess I have the 10th spiritual gift because if somebody walks out of my life, then, hey, keep stepping, as Martin used to say, then let them walk. I mean, why, why would I want someone to stay in my life if they don't want to be there? I mean, I'd be a bigger fool than them if I begged them to stay. It didn't make sense. The exit door is as important as the entrance door. The bathroom in your house is as important as the kitchen. Listen to me. God is allowing people to exit your life so you will be in the proper position to receive the blessing he has destined for you to receive. So when a person leaves your life, don't allow yourself to become bitter. Face the fact, people will walk away from you. People will betray you. And betrayal is something others do to you. But bitterness, listen to me. Bitterness is something you do. Everyone has experienced the pain of betrayal. I have, you have, pastors, preachers, everybody has. Everybody has had people that they love walk away. But remember Jesus had 12 chosen disciples and one of them was a devil. Come on now. Just stay with me. You must have people in your life who will speak what God says about you and not what other people say about you. Let me say that again. You need to have people in your life who will speak what God says about you. You are a child of the most high God. Bless yourself. There was a, there was, there was a, was a comedian who many years ago said something that just, you know, took flight. It said, you know, when, when you're out there doing things, you know, treat yourself. And so God says, bless yourself. People who will focus on where you are going to instead of what you are going through. People who speak not what they feel or see, but rather what the word has already declared. People who believe in your dreams and visions. You need people in your life who are people of faith. Why? Because people of faith don't say, hold the fort. They shout, let's possess the land. People of faith don't focus on the giant. They focus on the grapes, baby. Faith people don't look at the storm. They look at the rainbow. People of faith will tell you, says you are, and you can have what God says you can have. They even do what the scripture says in Romans 4.17, call those things that be not as though they were. So if the devil tells you that you're going to uh, not be prosperous, then you know, he's a lie. The devil is a liar. The devil does not have the power to stop you. Your enemies do not control your future. Your destiny is in your hand as well as God. Where you are is not at your end. Where you are is not your end. The pit was not the end for Joseph, three Hebrew boys. The lion's den was not the end for Daniel. And greatest of all, the tomb was not the end for Jesus. These were just places and things that they had to go through so that they could get to their end. Amen. Hallelujah. The truth is, the things they went through prepared them. For their greatest blessings 
the, ro- the road to your destiny, the road to your ministry will lead you uh, through a lot of places and through a lot of betrayals. But in the end, you will go where God said you will go, and you will be what God said that you will be. Sometimes uh, many of us will feel that nobody understands what we're going through as we move toward our destiny. Uh, There's going to be times, brothers and sisters, friends and visitors, uh, that you will feel like giving up. I know there's somebody listening to me right now feeling like giving up and that there's nobody to encourage you. Well, I stopped by tonight to tell you, what do you do in these times? You encourage yourself. Encourage yourself. Don't expect everybody to understand what you're going through. Don't expect everybody to speak words of encouragement. It's not going to happen. Encourage yourself in the Lord your God. During those times of discouragement and tests and temptations and trials, because you're going to have them, encourage yourself in the Lord. Don't allow everybody to speak into your life. Don't let everybody speak into your life. Don't allow everybody that carries a Bible, you know, to, 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 to you know, talk over or tell you what they think is right. Don't allow everybody uh, to, lay, to, 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 to come up to you and put their hands on your shoulder as though they're trying to be your best friend. Protect your blessing. Protect your blessing. Protect your dreams and your visions. Watch who you allow to impart into your life. Watch who you allow open the door into your life. Some people will impart fear into you instead of faith. And some people uh, even sometimes or so-called uh, men of the cloth or men and women of God operate under a bad spirit. And when they minister to you, they will impart that bad spirit into your spirit. You need people in your life, friends, who are godly, people who are stable, not double-minded, but stable, Uh, not people who are like the wind. Uh, One day they blow this way and the next day another way. Uh, One day they say one thing and the next day they say something totally opposite. That's bipolar, by the way. One day they believe in you and the next day they don't. One day they're for you, and the next day they are against you. You need people. We need people. I need people in your life and my life that you can trust, people that love you when you are on the mountain, but also when you find yourself in the valley, people who love you in the good times, but also in the bad times. You need people in your life who will Stand beside you during the heat of the battle and say, I am going to help you fight your way to this battle. Elijah in 2 Kings 2.8 took his mantle, wrapped it together, smoked the water, and they were divided. The water divided. And so they went, Elijah and Elisha, uh, they went over uh, dry ground. Everybody didn't cross Jordan. Everybody did not pick up the mantle of Elijah. But there are, there, there, I, but I want to leave, I want to leave with, with this in mind. There are secrets that God wants to reveal to you, not, you know, mystical secrets, but he can't do it as long as you have too many other voices speaking into your life. Things that God wants to reveal to you, but he can't do it as long as you have You know, too many people, too many voices in your ear. There are places that God wants to take you, but he can't as long as you allow people to hold you back. There are blessings that God wants to give you, my friend, but he can't give them to you as long as people have a stronger influence on your life than he does. If somebody has a stronger influence on your life than God does, then God can't give, really reveal or give you the blessing that you, that you need. Once Elijah and Elisha crossed the Jordan, a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared, and Elijah was taken up into heaven by a whirlwind. The Bible says in 2 Kings 2.11, and it came to pass, 
as they still went on and talked, that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire, horses of fire, and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up uh, by a whirlwind uh, into heaven. And when Elijah saw it, he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw them no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. He took up the mantle of Elijah and fell from, that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had smitten the waters, they parted, and Elijah went over. Because Elijah was willing to walk away from the sons of the prophets and go where they were not willing to go, he received the things he desired so much. And that was the double portion of Elijah's anointing. Any of the sons of the prophets could have been there to pick the mantle up, but they chose to view from afar. They even tried to stop Elisha from following Elijah. But Elisha was determined to stay with Elijah regardless of the cost. Elisha simply walked away from the sons of the prophets and cross the Jordan without them. If you tonight have to walk away from people to get to the place where God is calling you, start walking tonight. There's some people you need to cut out of your life uh, tonight. Once you get to the place God is calling you and receive all that God has promised you, you will be so glad you did. But nobody, and hear this good, friends, Nobody is worth losing your destiny. Nobody is worth you losing your ministry over, regardless of how bad you want people to go with you. Remember this. Remember, everybody can't go where God is taking you. Stay in God's drip for this lesson. Thank you for listening. May God bless you, and may he bless you real good. You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. God has been around. The Lord's been around. Before the death of the earth.
the happy days that will be on that judgment day. I know that's a happy day. We don't know the day nor the hour, but I know that's gonna be a happy day. The Lord has a mansion prepared A mansion prepared for you and for me And oh Lord, oh Lord In the You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. Ladies and gentlemen, what a show, what a show. I want to thank my listeners for riding, uh, for listening to the show on tonight. I certainly appreciate everyone who's participated on the broadcast. This has been a great show. This has probably been one of my better shows that I've really enjoyed listening to. Both my speakers did a great job. All of my co-hosts do an outstanding job every week. But this brother, uh, Frank, Dr. Frank Washington, I think he was talking to me tonight, I tell you. Brother, I certainly appreciate that message on tonight. Certainly appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for tuning into our broadcast. We certainly appreciate those who've been following our radio show through Blog Talk Radio, as well as through social media. My dear brother, Robert Lee Johnson, he was he was answering his question, and he was also live on Facebook uh, doing his presentation of the show. I certainly appreciate my co-host, Courtney Carruthers, for his lesson. There's a bully in the church. Lord, have mercy. That brother, he preached on tonight. We certainly appreciate his efforts, and also Dr. Frank Washington, on the road to loneliness. Ladies and gentlemen, what a show. I really appreciate this show tonight. It is our prayer that the things that were said on this broadcast have been beneficial to your spiritual lives and you've given yourself over to a study of God's Word. We certainly appreciate all those who have participated on the show and those who've been following this radio show on Blog Talk Radio. Ladies and gentlemen, on, my, on behalf of my host, on behalf of my co host on the Gospel Light Radio Show, we really do appreciate your love and support for this radio broadcast. Good night, everybody. God bless you. You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. It ain't easy. No. Sometimes it gets hard down here, Lord. Sometimes it gets rough. Get tired, so tired. 
Gospel Light Radio Show. You've been listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show, episode 230.
Two.